respond directly to her presentation. It's about the Mexican geospatial data, uh, which uh, was related to Brian's uh, presentation earlier. Simana is an advisor of the governing board of the National Institute of Statistics and Geography of Mexico. She has worked in virtual and augmented reality, as well as in 3D geometry processing. She has a Master of Science in Computer Graphics, Vision, and Imaging from the University College of London and a postgraduate in mobile technology. She is currently enrolled in a postgraduate degree in statistical methods at the Center for Mathematical Research from Mexico, where research involves satellite image segmentation for land cover. So now I'd like to introduce everyone to Ms. Amena, so take it over. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I hope you can see my screen. Yeah, Jimena, we can see it perfectly. So please take it away. Thank you. OK, so thank, thank you for your kind introduction. My name is Jimena Juarez. I am I am mostly invested in the work related with the Mexican Geospatial Data Cube. I have other roles in the agency, but it's been a, an, an interesting journey that I want that I want to share with you today. Um, the, the the Mexican Geospatial Data Cube wa was born in 2018 as as a concept uh, idea that we wanted to to test within the institution. And today we have reached uh, the the credit or the, the the right to call it an operational data cube, and I will explain to you in a bit what what we mean by that. But first of all, and um, just like a copying uh, Brian's method, we first want to define what we are going to be referring during this session. So, what is the Mexican Geospatial Data Cube? For public agencies responsible for the production of geographic and statistical information, such as um, my own, INEGI, um, satellite images offer an unprecedented am amount of information, uh, such as uh, and and also an unprecedented, you know, uh, di diversity of opportunities to build consistent time series, uh, while mitigating the scarcity of availability. Uh, of in situ data, which is a, pro a problem that most uh, official agencies can, can face, uh, whether it is a just geographical institution or a statistical uh, office. However, and despite the, its usefulness in the informed uh, path towards sustainable development, the management of this uh, tool, of the special uh, data tools and uh, the data cube itself, presents important challenges in terms of the volume of the data, the speed that they are produced in, and the variety of them. So these challenges, we call them the big data challenges. Uh, the amount of information available uh, currently in the world has increased maybe by 20 times uh, the last uh, seven to 10 years. And today, this data already exists in the petabyte scales. So that is uh, indeed a, a big data issue that we faced. The frequency with which the information is generated is also remarkable. For example, and we've seen some of them mentioned here, satellites exist capturing an image of every point of the Earth's surface every day. Um, in addition, there is great heterogeneity in the data available for the wide diversity of sensors and resolutions and these also serve to solve issues in different thematics, which is a, a positive thing. But under this premise, INEGI Im implemented the Mexican Special Data Cube, MGDC, we call it in, in this um, context, um, seeking to increase the value and the impact of satellite images through a consistent and standardized architecture. Um, I'm, I'm very happy that Brian presented before the, the Open Data Cube and gave you a little bit of context, but uh, this is the Mexican implementation of the Open Data Cube. And well, this, and this standardized architecture of the data 
is, is used for the exploitation of it, as well as the complex computational infrastructure that is required. So we are talking about the two things here. He also mentioned that we have our infrastructure on-premise, which, which is true and which is represented a, a very huge challenge for us and, and never before seen challenge um, uh, initiative in INEGI. Um, this, this tool basically is a new paradigm that aims to face uh, the big data challenge of the satellite images with a more efficient approach to storage and manage uh, this, this type of data. And, and hence reducing the barriers for the generation of products ready for the analysis. Uh, the Mexican Geospatial Cube, in a nutshell, is a tool that um, helps us analyze satellite images, great volumes of satellite images in order to produce timely and relevant information. The ecosystem of the Open Data Cube, the ecosystem of, of this tool is very sim simplified in this diagram. We go from the satellite data through a flexible development uh, to produce information for informed decisions but in, in this uh, center of the diagram, the very the, the flexible development, I think we should. Um, I, I think it's just oversimplified. But um, I, I, uh, the the main the the main quality of the data cube is that it uh, helps us organize large volumes of data into a data structure that is easier for our uh, servers and for our, and for our specialists both. Uh, to handle the data, to analyze the data, and basically it converts uh, a bunch of files into one single data structure so that the instructions that you feed into some um, console or some user interface are very uh, standard and they they reduce the amount of work that the, that the specialist needs before the actual analysis. So we call it the the pre-processing stage, you know, the corrections, the selections of the data, like uh, the the presence of clouds, the time of the dur during the year that the image was was taken, also uh, uh, involves uh, several hours of man work, which we are able to reduce using this automated system to search for all of the available data. Open Data Cube is a very robust system. Uh, it is uh, it, it is useful or it is uh, suitable for very types of information, very very sorry very diverse types of information, but all of them uh, uh, being raster. Uh, it was developed initially for the exploitation of specifically the Landsat archive, but uh, currently the the architecture has evolved so that it can accept all of the different types of raster data. We are currently thinking or planning to incorporate uh, Sentinel-2 data into our data queue, which is also a challenge. You know, Sentinel increases the their resolution, but currently the data queue uh, has the complete Landsat archive for for the Mexican territory. And that's where I wanted to go when I talk about uh, an operational data queue. Uh, basically, in in Mexico, we uh, we took the road from, you know, testing the, the information to having an operational or an institutional data queue. And that started in 2018 when we went to take a training, a, a one month training in Australia to comprehend the, the tool, uh, the, this tool is more than than uh, images. It's a core of Python libraries. It's um, it's a ref reference data database that helps us uh, identify the uh, the desired image for our analysis. So back in 2018, we had the the opportunity to engage in this workshop. 
uh, we, we were training in Geoscience Australia. They very kindly gave us also a set of images for that when we were to return to, to Mexico, we were able to prove our to prove the concept. We had the images corresponding to two whole years. So those were about 9,000 images that we took uh, home, that we returned with uh, so that we could prepare our proof of concept. Uh, it, it should be mentioned that the infrastructure that they had in Australia was very, very, very impressive and not at all comparable to the to the one that we had in Mexico. So we had to adapt. So when we returned to to Mexico in 2008, in August 2018, we started to adapt the the tool to the available servers we started with you know whatever server we could get our hands on from our it department they were basically servers that were not in use anymore so we didn't get the the opportunity to design which infrastructure we we were going to to work with at the, at the moment because we were working on a proof of on a, on a concept proof uh, at, at this time, we also uh, designed products, uh, we, we designed services, we uh, proposed budgets adapted to other budgets, and basically we were uh, working on indexing the images to the institutional servers, ingesting the images to these as well, and, you know, defining the more specific parameters that we were not able to define in Australia, such as the the projection, the, the grid that we were going to work on, that was a uh, very intense work because this grid, you know, is going to be fixed for life, for, for the life of the data cube as, at least. So in the end, what data? Uh, after this year of work, we received a, in March of 2019, sent, sent actually by, by Bryant, we received a, 10, no, 100, sorry, 100 terabytes of images, you know, um, explained in this, in this diagram. Uh, no, no, sorry, uh, we, we only have from Landsat, uh, Landsat 7 and, and so, but it was one, 100 terabytes of data which we received directly from NASA. Why is that? Because the specific data that we need to include in the in the data cube is a very specific, very high quality data this data is corrected and it was only available on demand so even though we could request them through their website uh, through their the website of the USGS this data was not uh, available so it needed to be prepared uh, in our estimates, we, we thought that we it will take us more than two years to obtain the data through this um, media. But, uh, and perhaps one, one more year to download it. So we, we were very impressed and happy by the by the help that were provided by the USGS and NASA CEOs. And that also gave us a ton of work to, to start in March 20. 2018. Afterwards, we were working with 130,000 images, which we needed to uh, index and ingest to the to the servers. Previously, we had worked with two years images of two years, so we had gained the experience to automate this process. But uh, it was still a, a lot of work, but. And, and it took us months, months to ingest this, these images to, to, the, to the servers. Back in November 2019, so uh, probably half a year later, we, we finalized this activity. So we had all of the Landsat archive um, available in this uh, analysis ready format and ingested in our, in our data cube. From that moment, we started developing the automated scripts that will allow us to ingest the uh, the, the updates of the of the information, the, the images that were released uh, each week by by the USGS and NASA. So 
it was a two year two year process in which we started with a training with a um, set of images trying and testing and by the end of 2019 we had an operational data cube with what which was uh, including or automatically incorporating incorporating the the newly available information released uh, weekly by by nasa considering the large amount of data that we have uh, the, the analysis represents a computational challenge as, as i mentioned for example just for 2015 we have 6074 images which reaches about 7 7.5 terabytes and it is certainly not not easy to run a script that uh, analyzes 7.5 terabytes uh, within the memory uh, at, at one time so this challenge was addressed by the inter interdisciplinary team that i mentioned that went to training in australia uh, which uh, included big data experts the computational infrastructure which where we have installed our instance currently which has evolved from from the time i mentioned before uh, is an oracle cloud machine so this computer has the capacity to generate national products with a pixel level precision and in this diagram i am showing you some of these national products for the year 2015 on on the right side uh, these products were uh, proposals that we prepared during our testing time we prepare uh, questionnaires to specific users for them to evaluate the usefulness or or you know the the overall uh, specific the, the overall quality of these products for their uh, production processes and the one that is circled in in red is called the the geomedian which i will be referring to uh, in a few more minutes but well we have the the geomedian a, a famous ndvi wolves which is not as famous but very relevant for us we are on the process of of uh, producing a, a, a national version of WOFs, um, but I just wanted to clarify that this tool is the result of a trial and error uh, process. Uh, well, it should be clarified that this is a trial and an error process. Uh, wh while we were adapting the available resources, which uh, I mentioned, you know, uh, this was not an, an institutional um, uh, an institutional activity at the moment. It, it was a project, so we were working with what we had. We started with a proof of concept to test different installation um, formats and use techniques, which allowed us to show us the, to show showcase the value of this tool which was necessary to get the approval for uh, achieving or for obtaining a more suitable infrastructure. With time, more and more resources were being assigned to our project until we became institutional and operational. That happened last year, uh, the, the institutional part. In this diagram, we describe on a very high level the way in which our infrastructure is built. There's also reference um, of our physical servers. On the left side of this diagram, we see the specs of the virtual machines hosted in our Oracle Cloud uh, machine. It's um, OCM there. Altogether, we work with um, 64 cores and over 472 gigabytes in RAM. While on the right side of this diagram, we show the two types of storage use, SAN and NAS, with different characteristics fit for their specific purpose. For example, in the NAS storage, uh, the fastest of them, we keep the cube itself. In other words, the actual satellite data, so the, the Landsat archive. The pre-processed and reprojected images in a massive array structure are in the NetCDF format, which optimizes its use and keep it that keeping the raster array in a NAS type storage allows us um, access and analysis, allows us to easier uh, and 
allows us to access and analyze these uh, resources easier and, and faster. Um, you are also able to see in this diagram an estimate of the volumes of images for periods like 1984 and 1999, which is six terabytes for the period of 2000 and from 2000 to 2020. It's around 20 terabytes. That happens because of the NetCDF format. Um, on the other hand, on our SAN storage, we keep a backup of the Landsat archive in the format we receive it and other things like the products we have created already, um, although they were just for testing purposes or for publishing as well. It is important to mention that um, growing is within our plans, as I mentioned before. For example, we plan to incorporate uh, the Sentinel-2 archive but we will need to perhaps have three times the available storage we have today. Um, we, we started running simple scripts in small regions using an average laptop, uh, maybe with eight gigabytes in RAM. So the, the progress I think is very remarkable. Uh, take, please take into account that this software is pretty, pretty uh, flexible. So you can try to, you can start to use it uh, very much in, in in a couple of hours. And maybe if you start using Brian's, uh, Brian's alternative, it will take you probably a couple of minutes to, to get ready. The platform allows accessing, processing, and analyzing lar large volumes of satellite images. And these represent an ideal input for the generation of information due to their increasing availability, objectivity, and periodicity. The Mexican Geospatial Data Cube, uh, we designed it to produce an ever-growing range of decision-ready products on vegetation, water, land cover, urban growth, and many others. And additionally, uh, should be mentioned that the data management of the Mexican Geospatial Data Cube is done through commands in Python, which is one of the most popular programming languages among data scientists. And this uh, can further extend the horizons of satellite image analysis to the applications of the most recent techniques of the domains of data science, uh, which is an area of study of great dynamism and exponential progress. In INEGI, we have currently opened the, um, the, the data science area, which is um, called officially the Data Science Laboratory of INEGI. So they are the, the most uh, active users of this tool, along with the, the deputy direction of the geography department. But this this tool allows the merge of two different worlds the, the worlds of the remote sensing sensing scientists and the role of the data scientists we've been able to produce the products that i mentioned uh, before you know vegetation water which are are very relevant to the remote sensing experts but currently we are trying to explore uh, different techniques such as a, a machine learning and deep learning to uh, explore the, the potential of this tool, especially in the, in the integration of this information with statistical information. There are several methods for the generation of mosaics of national coverage. This is just uh, one of them which we um, which we produce using the data cube. The mechanisms based in pixel time series statistics consider the pixel sequence for each band over time and calculates, calculates some statistics that summarizes the observations to create an image composite. But a common practice is to estimate a one dimensional statistic for each of the bands. This alternative usually produces good images However, it does not preserve the spectral relationships. Um, the, the Landsat Geomedian is an official product of INEGI, which you may find in our website. And it's just a proposal that uh, can help the exploitation of the Mexican Geospatial Data Cube, as well as the 
uh, dissemination of this this tool to the common uh, citizen or the common users. This diagram shows us how this method is it's produced. This uh, algorithm was designed by uh, the University of Australia, the Dr. Uh, Dale Roberts, as a collaboration with Geoscience Australia. They were looking to en enhance the the production of national mosaics or, or composites. The, the geomedian, as I mentioned, preserves the spectral, uh, the spectral ratio between the, the spectral bands. So it allows us to, uh, to, to work with it as, as it was uh, an original image to, to create or to produce normalized uh, indexes out of it. This is a, also, uh, well, th th this is also remarkable for us because it summarizes around 7.5 terabytes of images into one single image, and it, it this image allows for the for the analysis that is typically used in the world of the remote sensors, which is the spectral analysis. With, with these pixel composition approaches for the generation of mosaics, people seek to obtain images featuring improved color balance. One of these algorith algorithms, as I mentioned, is this one, the geomedian, for which two variables are considered, the geographic region and the period of the analysis that you want to, to work on. The final product is a national mosaic of multispectral images in TIFF format. And these mosaics represent the characteristics of the terrain in a specific period. Thus, the geomedian is a composition-based approach at the pixel level that takes a collection of observations of the Earth and collapses, collapses them into a single image. This composition maintains spectral relationships between the bands, maintain a good representation of typical observation that lacks outliers and reduce or practically eliminated spatial noise. And in the diagram, you, you will see the process for obtaining this geomedian for the collection of images to the construction of mosaics right on the bottom part of it, uh, which is the final step, which is generating a scale pixel composite by compos compositing uh, pixels or, you know, these uh, tiles of 5,000 and 5,000 tiles per site, which is just a way in which we distribute this, this file. It's just a, a way to, to allow the users to access just uh, specific regions without them having to download the whole national archive. For each of the national Landsat geomedians, we use the data in the, in the data cube that corresponds to one single year. So we have around uh, 30 uh, geomedians published in the, in, the, in the website currently. And the processing time is around 24 hours on average plus the final result, like one uh, single geomedian size is about 35 gig gigabytes, which is pretty uh, manageable with uh, personal resources. So this is how the geomedian looks. Uh, this is the first product delivered from the exploitation of the Mexican Geosp Geospatial Data Cube. And also they seem like a photograph of the national territory taken in a single instant. Uh, we have learned the, so far that each geomedian is actually a statistical summary known as a geometric median generated at the national level from satellite images corresponding mostly to uh, the period of one single year. Um, th this program presents an opportunity to observe and interpret, in, interpret the variations of the Mexican territory in a single, um, in a, in a single uh, look, glimpse, as well as the most complex analysis through the applications of advanced and emerging techniques like that, like uh, deep learning that and machine learning. As I mentioned, the data is made available to the public on the official INEGI site and is um, uh, for the greater practicality, uh, the files are divided into the smaller sections or, or tiles that I mentioned before. So it will be possible to, to make partial downloads. Uh, 
This is an example of the exploitation of the geomedian regarding urban growth. So I will play this video in which you will see the city of Aguascalientes, my, my city where in his headquarters are from the year of two, I'm sorry, from the year of 2000 to the year of 2019. And then from the year 1984 to 2018. Basically, this is an example that shows us that the, the geomedian is fit for us to observe the change in the cities and estimate uh, surface uh, surface statistics like the like like the one we've seen here. Another example of the geomedian is for the use of the observation of the productive infrastructure development, such as this industrial park in the state of Puebla, it's uh, also in the center of Mexico. And this, sorry, this other example is very interesting. So in here we are we are seeing the region of Montes Azules and Marques de Comillas. Um, Mont Montes Azules is a national protected area, and Marques de Comillas is the the area that that is around it. So I don't know if you know of the La Candona jungle. So this is one of the areas in Mexico where the most uh, where the vegetation is most abundant. The, the border of this region is this river that you are seeing now. And we can see clearly that the difference in the vegetation from this almost 30 year difference is pretty drastic. So this allows us to evaluate the, the effect of this of this public policy, which is declaring this area as a natu natural protected area. Another example is the observation of water bodies like the Chapala Lake in the state of Jalisco. This is the, the geomedian, uh, the geomedian product over uh, the Chapala Lake in which we uh, are able to see that the surface of it is reduced greatly. By the year of 2002, we have the lowest uh, surface observed, but thanks to public policy that favor more responsible use of water in the region, the, the lake was able to recover uh, its volume. This this lake is the, the principal uh, the principal water source for the city of Guadalajara, so one of the three largest city in Mexico. So the lake was being was was being exploited in this time in these years. with very few conscious, so but very little conscious. So the, this also is an example of how we can observe the success of public policy. If we if we quantify the the pixels, we, we could also obtain the actual value of the surface uh, because we are using the mm -hmm. Albers Equiaria projection, which maintains the, the least uh, deformation in uh, regarding area. So it's a simple conversion of the number of pixels which are um, which are classified as water in order to generate uh, a value or statistical value of the surface, uh, statistical because it's a, a year summary. But this is also one of the reasons which in well, one of the reasons we we decided to use this projection because um, working at the national level 
it is useful to have a very easy at hand method to obtain statistical uh, statistics, sorry, surface statistics. This is also a very common uh, approach in the, in the agenda for the sustainable development of the UN or, or the 2030 agenda. Another example is here. Hi, hi Jimena. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to, to interrupt, um, but we've already crossed over time and the uh, organizers from Phosphor-G are asking if we could please wrap it up. So I don't know if, if you could, uh, you know, try to close. No problem. Please. Sorry, I, I wasn't seeing my, my chat, so I, I couldn't. So, well, finally, I, I would just like to remind you that the tool is accessible in, in his website. This is where you can find it under uh, research or investigation. And you will see something uh, that says uh, geographical products and enter here. Also the, the downloading um, uh, instructions. And well, this is just a, a, a brief summary of the challenges and benefits that we have faced. We are uh, working with a, um, Python scripts that can allow us to use a, a tiny version or a portable version of this tool called the Cubito, Tiny Cubito. And we are also looking to work with uh, data grids or grids that can allow us to integrate statistical information to the data cube in, in, in an easier and more practical way. Uh, so sorry for taking more time and this is uh, the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Jimena. And um, actually, there were there were quite a few questions in the chat. But since we have uh, gone over time, we're thinking of maybe there's uh, other ways of us to to get the question to you, the questions to you, maybe through Twitter. There was a lot of um, interest in you know this technology. I guess with that, I will also turn it back over uh, if Francis is still available, just to to close off the session. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Emil and Jimena, for, for that presentation. Yes, unfortunately, we have uh, run through our time, and uh, I'd like to thank everyone for attending this group on Earth, Earth Observations for this morning session. And uh, we will continue on this stage after the break in two hours. So, again, thank you for everyone. If you're watching the recording, uh, thank you for attending the session. You all have a good day. Good night.